testing, testing, one, two, three. All right. Okay, good. Good. All right. All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending the Rising Christian Bible Study. Let me put this on the right screen. There we go. Um, we endeavor to study the Word of God every Thursday night, um, with the exception of next Thursday night. Um, but I'll, I'll make sure to make an announcement about that at the end of this Bible study. Um, all right, awesome. Let's pray and just dive right into the Word of God. Father God, we come to you now because you are the source of everything that we need, that we desire, that we want. You loved us so much that you gave your only begotten son and that whoever believes in him would have everlasting life, would not perish, but have everlasting life. We lean on you heavily, Father God, we trust in you. Lord Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. So we're looking to you. Please show us your glory in this Bible study, Lord Jesus. Please reveal more of yourself to us. Holy Spirit, please teach us uh, through myself and through the other people that are participating in this Bible study. Help us all to see more of you and to see more of Jesus. We lean and trust heavily on you. We're looking to you, Lord. In Jesus' name do we pray. Amen. All right, awesome. All right, so Rising Christian Bible Study. Uh, today's topic we're going to be talking about is fulfilling the law. Fulfilling the law, right? Um, in Proverbs 4.23, we are told, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Now, uh, the Old Testament, as most people know, is written uh, in Hebrew, right? And this word heart in Hebrew, pronounced lab, is defined as, I get, got this from Strong's Concordance, is defined as the inner man, the mind, the will, the heart, okay? So your heart is the center of your being. Now, there's a number of different theories I've heard. The two dominant theories some people will say your spirit is your heart. Okay. Um, uh, the the theories I, I lean more towards is the idea that man, human beings are uh, a spirit, a soul, and a body. Okay. And that area where your spirit, soul, and body meet, the center of your being, is your heart. Now, the Bible doesn't necessarily explain that exhaustively. Um, but like I said, there are a number of theories. That's the one I lean towards. Um, like I said, some people say your spirit is your heart. Um, there are people that say, you know, that believe um, you, you're a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body. I'm sure you've heard a lot of that. Um, I lean um, more towards the idea that, and I, I I got this from listening to a lesson by Joseph Prince. Uh, I listen to him a lot. Um, that God is an internal infinite being that exists in three persons. God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. But they're unified. They're all one. No beginning, no end. Okay? No part of the Godhead was created. So it's all God, but it's in three persons. I've said this in prior Bible studies. We don't fully understand the Trinity. Um, I think the Bible just, and and the, the church fathers being led by the Holy Spirit, 
were able to give us as much as they could uh, absorb about it. But you have to remember, you're trying to describe God. So we don't, but that's that's what is very clear. Well, yeah, people said that word trends. Yeah, it's true. The word trend is not in the Bible, but the idea and the concept is there. Okay. So it's all unified. <laughs> Excuse me. So I lean towards the same thing for men, that man is also a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. Man is created. Okay. We are created beings. Um, but I think that like God is a unified whole, I believe man is also a unified whole. Spirit, soul, and body. So the only difference is with human beings with that put their faith and trust in Christ, we will get a new body. So our physical body of the three parts of us is the part that is um, changeable. So you will one day get a new body um, that uh, relates to reality that is not very different. Okay? So I lean towards the idea that your heart is the center of your being where your spirit and soul body meet together. I believe that when you become a Christian, you get saved. You, prior to that, you're spiritually dead. But when you put your faith and trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit reconnects with your spirit and you become spiritually alive. Okay? So heart, laid, inner man, mind, will, heart. <laughs> okay. Now, this is so... This is Mark 7, 18. Jesus is walking with the disciples. They get hungry. They start eating uh, raw corn without washing their hands. The Pharisees see this, come to Jesus like, why are they doing that? Why are they going against our tradition, not washing their hands? Jesus strongly rebukes them. Say, you know, and he gives them a, 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 um, a small lesson, a, a parable, and he tells them, you know, you guys are hypocritical. It's not it's not what goes into you that defiles you, what comes out of you. He goes into the house and later the disciples, they come to him and say, can you explain that to us? Explain the parable you just told them. And in Mark 7, this is the New King James, this is what he said. So he said to them, are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart, there's that word, but his stomach and is eliminated thus purifying all foods. And he said, what comes out of a man, that defiles him, a man. For from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile a man. Okay? So the heart, things can come at you, right? For example, a person could look at these, you know, you go to Rome, you see these marble statues, some of them are new. One person could look at it and say, wow, what a beautiful piece of artwork. You know, how many, another person could look at the very same thing and get turned on, right? It's what's in your heart. <clears throat> it's how the outside world interacts with your heart. So the true issue is from within, it's from your heart, the seat of who you, the seat of who you are. Two people can perceive the same thing and interact with it very differently, depending on the conditions of their heart. Right now, Matthew 5 and 27, this is Jesus speaking. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You see that? So I think about that. So. See, prior to now, the Pharisees of the law, they, they understood the deed, the act of sins. But Jesus, the, un, the, the only begotten Son of God, man in the flesh, brought it to another level. 
he gave us a greater understanding because it's what's in your heart. So for example, I may not, I'm, I may not commit adultery, but it doesn't mean I'm not an adulterer because I may be an adulterer in my heart. A lot of people, well, excuse me, let me say it this way. Many people don't commit adultery, not because they don't want to, but because they're afraid of the results. Okay. So they would do it if they could get away with it. But there, some people are, as Joseph Prince, I've heard say, some people don't commit adultery because nobody looks their way twice. Nobody, you know. So the, the idea is you are what you are in your heart. You may not tell a lie, but it is possible you're still a liar. And the Holy Spirit knows that. God's level of perfection, his level of rawness, of seeing everything, is at the point where if I look at a married, if I'm married or and I look at a married woman and I have lustful thoughts about her, God's level of perfection of such that it is the same thing as if I had booked the hotel, snuck away with her, did our thing for a couple of hours, cleaned up, came back to work or church, pretend like nothing's happened. God is saying his level of perfection, that's how it, it's in your heart. And I think that's something that the Pharisees and Jesus was helping them. They were like, hey, we don't do these things. But Jesus says, yeah, but God knows your heart. He knows what's in your heart. You are who and what you are in your heart. So you may not have done it. It doesn't mean that's not who you are. Now, so we know don't sin indeed, right? Now you can't sin in thought, right? What's in your heart. <coughs> and now Bible gives us an even greater understanding. This is James 3 and 2, New King James Version. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. If you had a point of discipline where you do not sin in the words you use, the Bible says he is a perfect man, able to, so if you can control your tongue, you control your whole body. James 3 and 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and set on sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set and it is set on fire by hell. Okay. So what what do, so that's your tongue. So what have we seen? And we all know deed, our actions. But the Bible comes and gives us a greater understanding of how perfect God is, how completely raw God sees everything. That it isn't just your deeds, it's also your thoughts and your words. So here, to truly keep the law, it must be kept in word, thought, and deed. That's the entirety of who you are. The Pharisees, some, did, some of them didn't get that. So that, and some of us don't get it. I just, well, I'm okay. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't do anything. Yeah, but it's in your heart. Okay. So, um, for example, there's a particular denomination. Many of them I know, great people. You know, not not saying anything negative directly against them, but um, some of them I know they emphasize that you must keep, you must go to church on Saturday. You must keep the Sabbath, right? And some I know they hold that in high regard. But what I think many of them don't understand is the truth of the matter is you may think you're keeping the Sabbath, but you're not. So somehow, as, as long as you keep, you must keep the Sabbath, you must keep the Sabbath. It must be done. And some hold it in such a high regard, like that's that's the pinnacle of it, you know? Yeah, but if you go to church on Saturday, right, and you're you're attending service 
right? Sure. Um, you may be at that service, and coincidentally, the Sabbath is the day of rest. That's another confusion in that area. It's not the day of church service. I think that's another area where people don't don't get it. Uh, like one guy asked, why do you go to church on uh, on Sunday? Well, I tell him why I don't go to church on Sunday. I go on different days. But you you, you should go to church on, on Saturday, Sabbath. Well, Sabbath is day of rest. Okay? So I think that's it. But the item I'm trying to get say is that you can hold that. This is just an example. You can hold that in high regard. I'm keeping the Sabbath. Yes, but if while you're in church on the Sabbath, you look at a man or woman lustfully, right? You just fornicated. Or God's standard. If you're married and you committed adultery, okay? So that's not the end all and be all. That's not the clean, the clean slate, okay? So, so uh, James 2 and 10, for whoever shall keep the whole law. So if you're set on, you must keep the law. You must keep the law. Don't eat certain foods. You must go to church on Saturday. Um, you uh, uh, the ten, you got to keep the Ten Commandments, right? All right. So if, if you, if that's your means of reconnecting with God, right? What are we what are we told in James? For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Jesus came to earth. And he, he showed us something. The level of God's perfection is so high. You will never reach it by your own strength and your own power. Okay. If you break one law, right, you're guilty of all of it. That's God's level of perfection, right? So in the Old Testament, they, they use animal sacrifices like as a temporary cover. You know, or like the Bible said, kind, God kind of winked at it, okay? But regardless, for thousands of years, man constantly, read the Old Testament, and you know in your own personal lives, a lot of people you know, man constantly broke the law. Israel was separated into two kids. Now, think about this. King Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, the man who had it all, his heart was pulled away from worshiping God by his wives, the Bible says. He started worshiping other gods. To punish him, God separates the kingdom. He lets the line of David, which Solomon comes from, keep the kingdom of Judah. Everything else becomes Israel. When you study the Old Testament, as far as I know, no king of Israel, one after the other, were good. None of them. They all promoted worshiping idols. They all were committing uh, various sins, murder. None of them. Now, on the, the Judah side, many of them, most of them were bad, did the same thing that the kings of Israel did. But there were a few that were good. There were a few, like Hezekiah was one, Josiah's one, I believe Asa was another one, um, King Solomon initially. But if you'll notice, if you go back and study it, every one of those kings, even Josiah, has at least one mark against them. Every one of them. None of them had a perfect record. Uh, I believe Asa, if I remember correctly, became arrogant. And he went into the temple to give, which he's not allowed to do, but he insisted, and I believe that was Asa, I have to go back and study, he insisted on making sacrifices arrogantly, and God struck him with leprosy. Uh, kings, so, uh, every, so, no outside, no, no, no one is able to, keep, for you to keep the law perfectly, for you to get it, you have to get it in word 
thought and deed. Most of us, many of us, don't even get it in deed. A few of us might go through extreme measures, but it's still in you. No king of Judah, not one, was complete, was complete, had a completely clean state. Even King David, who's perhaps arguably, you know, the best of them all. Even Hezekiah has a mark against them. All right. All if you break one part of it, you're guilty of all of it. Now, so that can seem glim, right? But there is a more beautiful side to this. All right? And this is the one of the main points I want to get to in this Bible study this evening. Hebrews 10, 16. So when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, when you turn to, when you humble yourself and accept, I'm a sinner. God, I need your help. When you hear the gospel and you believe it, what does God do? This is in Hebrews 10, 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts. And in their minds, I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Yeah. What God has done for us is so wonderful through the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Old Testament, they had animal sacrifices that were, it was only a temporary fix. What does God do? You put your faith and trust in Jesus his blood cleanses you, past, present, and future. Remember the prior Bible studies where we talked about how God lives outside of space and time? Yahshua HaMashiach, the Messiah, the only begotten, his blood is so, the blood of God is so powerful and so perfect. It cleanses you your whole life of all sin. So God does that. But now what about our behaviors, right? Because you're forgiven. You're reconnected with the Father. But we all know that we have something in us called the sin nature. Right? So spiritually, Father God, the Holy Spirit reconnects us. You become spiritually alive. But our heart, we're giving a we're given a new heart and a new nature. But within man, there's a part of him known as the sin uh, nature or the flesh that still needs to be renewed, still needs to, to grow, still needs to be transformed. So what does God do? Because you are who you are in your heart. What does he do? He puts his laws in your heart and in your mind. Right? Your sins, your lawless deeds, he doesn't remember anymore. So as a Christian, will you sin? Yes. <laughs> but the idea is as you keep seeing Jesus, as you keep beholding his glory, as the Holy Spirit is continuously working on you, what will happen is you will sin less and less and less and less. So it's not necessarily a, you know, we like that. Hit us hard. We scream with emo. Now, no, it's a, grow it's a relationship. It's a growing process. Some things will stop immediately. Some things might take time. Right. But it's all it's all a matter of the growth and the minimizing of that sin nature. Now. How does the Bible prescribe to us? What helps you now reading, meditating, you can memorize scriptures. But one of the chief ways the Bible tells us is that as you behold the glory of the Lord, like you're looking in a mirror, as you behold the glory of the Lord, the Holy Spirit is transforming you more and more into the image of the Lord, until that image. So you're becoming more and more like God. So that's why sometimes some Christians, they believe, they receive the gospel, but why do some grow slowly? You know, and we've, we've seen that. We've seen it in our own lives. Why so? It's all a matter of how much of a revelation you receive of Christ. The more you see Jesus, the more you become like God, and your sin nature, your habits, your behaviors will go down slowly. Now, what if you're seeing little of Jesus? Then you're going to get little growth. And some people do not, some Christians do not have a Christ-centered or gospel-centered life. 
they they believed. So now there's some, and remember I said this in a prior prior Bible study. I may someone may lead you in a sinner's prayer, but they don't know what's happening in your heart, right? Because another part of becoming Christians, what do you believe in your heart? So there are some people who've done the sinner's prayer, but in their heart they never truly believe. Those people are actually not even Christians, and sometimes we can see that in their behaviors. But I do believe there are those who who are sincerely they have um, believed the gospel, believed on the Son of God. They've become saved, hosts, but their lives sometimes don't show a lot of fruit or real slow fruit. And we sometimes will disregard, so it's not saved. No, I think sometimes it's just a matter of some Christians are not growing. Some are growing faster than others. Some are not growing, are growing very little. Why? Because they're not beholding the glory of the Lord. Their lives are not Christ-centered. The more you see Jesus, the greater revelation of, of revelation of Christ, the more you become like God. Right? And, and as you become more and more like God, internally, it will come out externally. So then your outer life, so your inner life, your heart, he's writing, right? His laws on your heart. So, so the fruits of the spirit will grow in you, love, joy, peace, uh, unforgiveness, self, self-control. That'll grow in you. And then you'll see the results out of it in your life. But I think one of the issues, I've said this in prior Bible studies, is that I believe many Christians and many, not all, but many ministries, they've lost their first love. Um, they're not Christ-centered. Not, so the Christians that are feeding there, they're not growing as much as they could or as they should. They're growing. I believe there's always some amount of growth, but I believe the maximum amount of growth is obtained when you see, continuously see more and more of Jesus. Right? God helps us. He knows that we he knows we can't do it at our own strength. What does it say? I will put my laws into their heart and in their minds. I will write them. Their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. And when God says he's not going to do something, he's not going to do it. Because He's in, God has infinite self-control. If he says he's not going to, he won't remember it. You might remember it, but he won't remember. All right, so let's summarize. <laughs> One, your heart is the center of your being. It is the foundation of who you really are. Right? Remember that. <laughs> you are who you are in your heart. Right? It's not because some of us have great self-control. Some don't. And some of us are really good at hiding who we really are. Um, you'd be amazed. i and I've probably amazed myself at times, and I'm sure when you've done things and shocked yourself that, wow, I, I can't believe I really did that. But yeah, um, to truly keep the law, remember this. You it must, So what does this mean? It's telling you why you need a sacrifice. Doesn't matter how much of the law you, 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 you think you're keeping. If you truly want to keep it and be righteous, you have to keep it. In word, thought, and deed, if you truly want to be righteous. That's why we need a sacrifice. That's why we needed God to die for us and his blood to cleanse us. Because you might you might keep it in, in word and thought. Well, tip, well, then you probably would keep, keep it. You might keep it in deed. But, and even word, you might control your tongue. But who are you on the inside? Third point, if you break any part of the law, you are guilty of breaking all of it. So you might boast in one area, right? But if you break one part of it, you're guilty of, of all of it. And last, when you believe in Jesus and accept the gospel, God helps you by putting his laws in your heart and mind. So then you don't have to be dependent um, on your actions. Praise God. Awesome. All right. Awesome. Okay, so uh, I'm 
One, two. Stop sharing. Awesome. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone. So now I'm going to open the I'm going to open the forum for everyone for any questions or any comments. Give me a minute. Let me uh, yeah. Just give me one minute. I'm like, <laughs> I just, I. Mm. All right, we're unmuted. Oh, okay, good. So it's working? Yes. All right, awesome. Okay, good. All right, so I guess um, you can unmute yourselves. Any questions, any comments, any good recipes or good jokes? That's uh... I, I just want to say, I think, um, just want to praise God and thank him for the Holy Spirit because without the Holy Spirit, I think that we will always and continue to fall into sin because it's pretty hard to not think or do a sinful action. You don't want to do it intentionally, but there's a possibility you can do it unintentionally. Like if somebody was to cut you off in traffic, you might say something mean or you might curse or, or whatever the case may be. And then now you've just sinned. Agreed. Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's it's um I think more people need to understand that I don't sometimes I don't think we fully get just how much we need God. To your point. Um it's so easy to sin. And then the other thing is you think we've been sinning all our <laughs> we've been sinning all our lives. You know, uh we're used to it. It's what we do. Um Someone says something, you say something back. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. It takes um, it takes the Holy Spirit. And I think one of the greatest tools the Holy Spirit has given us and has given to man is see more of Jesus. See more of Jesus. Um, the more you see Jesus, the more you become like God. Um I want to I want you all to be able to Oh here it is. I got it. Uh, all right. Okay. You should be able to unmute yourself now. Anyone yeah. should be able to. Okay. All right, good. Any other questions, comments, or discussions? Uh good evening. Uh Mr. Dixon's here. Praise God. Any other comments or questions? When I have a uh, what's this here? I think I might have a question. Oh wait. Go down here. All right. All right. Any other comments, questions? All right. Cool. Um. So the main thing I really wanted us to get from this particular Bible study is, uh, hey, brother. <laughs> is the import how much we need Jesus you cannot fulfill the requirements of the bible of your own strength no matter how much you try to discipline yourself you can beat yourself into your black and blue um it, it doesn't matter and you can keep one part but if you break any part of the law, you're guilty of it all. So we need the continual renewing of our minds by the Holy Spirit. And that's what the world needs. I think the idea is this world needs Jesus. Uh, and I think, I don't know if Christians, if we're displaying that strong enough to the world out there that the answer you're looking for, the answer that everyone is yearning for, can only be found through Christ. 
because the only way to the Father is to Jesus. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I was going to say it's very true. And you speak that to the Bible is important because the fact that there's so many people nowadays that are pushing following the law by itself without grace. You could Hebrew Israelites and different groups out there, or even Christians or those who call themselves different denominations, like said, they met this, who just keep pushing, keep pushing the law and not grace. So we're not careful. We can get caught into thinking that we're supposed to just, it's all about just, you know, trying to do right, just trying to follow the law and not accepting God's grace and love. So I think it's very key that you will. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, I know, uh, you know, if you think you're the real Israelite, hey, you know, <laughs> you know, knock yourself out, you know, um, but you're right, particularly like groups like that, they emphasize the law and the need to. But the reality is like we see. It doesn't matter. You may think you're keeping the law and you're not. And here's the rest. So um, this was brought up. So, for example, the the Jews are, are not a race, right? That's not what a Jew is. Not really. Okay. A Jew technically is a family of people. Technically, I think Old Testament truth and Israelite, or when God was given the promise, he told Abraham to his descendants. So a Jew, or let's say an Israelite, is a descendant of Abraham through his grandson, Israel. Right? And then Jew, I believe, came out of the term Judah because the one tribe was lost they're like the missing tribe. And the tribe of Judah is the only one that remained where people know they were carried into Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, allowed to come back. Um, and I think that's where the term Jew comes from, from Judah. But the reality is, truthfully, nobody really knows who a true Jew. Honestly, only God truly knows who are the real descendants of Abraham, right? So you have two groups saying, well, we're the real Jews, and we're the real Jews. And I think particularly the Hebrew Israelite, particularly because they, they connect so much with the Old Testament and say, well, we're the true Israelites. They emphasize, like they would do in the Old Testament, the law. But you can't keep the law. If you say you're a real Jew, a real, okay, I mean, I, I mean, does it, I personally don't think it matters. Um, I mean, it probably matters to them. But the idea is, okay, fine, you say you're a real Jew. Fine. So you, but you still can't keep. And and some of them in particular, if you say you're a real Jew, well then, are you doing animal sacrifices somewhere in your basement? You know. So, um, so that's how they emphasize that because they're into we're the real Jews. You know, we're the real Israelites, and so we got to keep the law. Well, you can't keep the law. They never could keep it. The Old Testament is very clear. So they were carried away. Into, they were constantly were, And the same way, you're not going to keep it outside the Holy Spirit helping you. Outside the Holy Spirit writing his laws in your heart and helping you, you're not going to keep it either. You may fool yourself into thinking you're keeping it, but you, you really aren't. Because God knows your thoughts. He knows who you really are in the seat of your being. And you're right. I think some of these denominations, they, they emphasize the wrong thing. We need to emphasize. Look, if you want to go to church service on a particular day of the week, hey, God bless you. Nothing wrong with that. But don't worship that day of the week. And don't think that that's your salvation. Regardless of what day you worship on the week or when you rest, you need a sacrifice. You need Jesus. You need the blood of Christ to cleanse you. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? Any other questions, comments, or concerns? All right. Well, awesome people. Oh, um, so there will be no Bible study next Thursday. Um, there will be no Bible study next Thursday. 
but by the grace of God, we will continue the Thursday afterwards. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, uh, I might figure out a way to even put a message on here, but we'll, but we'll see. Um, no, it says um because of some a personal it's a positive personal thing that's come up, so it's not not a bad thing. Um, so there'll be no Bible study next Thursday. Um, has okay before we sign off. Has everyone had a good week? Has all gone well with everyone? I need. A, I have a prayer request. A prayer. Uh, awesome. Yes, go ahead. So I applied for this job that speaks to every part of me. So um, yeah, just come in agreement with me that um, that they will take a look at my application and call me for interview. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Oh, definitely. Okay. Definitely. And I'll try to my best to when we do the closing closing out prayer. All right. And any other praise reports, prayer requests, comments or concerns? All right. All right. Awesome. All right, people. God bless you all. Um, thank you for attending this um, Bible study. Um, I hope you all blessed by it. Um, have an awesome week. Um, today is Thursday. Weekend starts tomorrow. You know, no matter what happens, try your best to just keep your eyes on Jesus. Whatever occurs in your life, um, talk to Jesus. You know, whatever's happening, you, you don't have to be loud. It doesn't have to be screaming and shouting. If you just pull away on me or even in, under your breath, whatever it is, if it's a big deal, talk to Jesus. If it's a little Oh, you consider it little? Talk to Jesus. I like how Joseph Prince says it. If it matters to you, it matters to God. And in uh, Proverbs, it tells us to um, don't lean on our under acknowledge God in all your ways. Don't lean on your own understanding, and He'll direct your path. So that all your ways is all your ways, big, little. So keep your eyes on Christ, um, and you and the Holy Spirit together as a family, as a team, will work everything else out. All right, awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and just close out, close this out in prayer, and I'm gonna uh, also we can agree in prayer with Ronice uh, for this job um, that she's applying for, and praise the Lord. All right, all hearts and minds clear. Thank you, Father God, for this opportunity to come and study Your Word. Uh, Holy Spirit, thank you for speaking to us. We ask that. Any and all seeds, good seeds that have been planted, please give them a harvest. Lord Jesus, remind us of your presence whenever, wherever. Help us, God. Help us. Reach down to us. Help us, Father, to see more of you, to fulfill your will. We are, we're not leaning and trusting in ourselves. We humble ourselves and heavily lean and trust in you. Ronis has brought this prayer request, Father God. You know, you know it all. You know the ins and out of everything. Not everything is naked and bare before you. She's presented her request to you. We ask you, please, that you would lead her and guide her in the way that she should go. Um, help the right people to see this application at the right time. Um, to get the right and godly results. Um, Father, she wants to be able to say, like you said, Lord Jesus, I do always the will of him that sent me. She said this job speaks to everything um, and her purpose in her, that you've put in her, in her heart. So we ask you, Father God, that you would lead her and guide her in this endeavor. Let your perfect will be done. Bless her abundantly, cause her may help the right people to see this application at the right time, Father God, and help her to get this position or open her eyes to whatever she needs to see about it or whatever direction she needs to go. Give her clear guidance, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Give her clear guidance, Father God, because she wants to please you and she wants to fulfill your will. We ask you, Father God, to bless her, bless her husband, bless her family, and cause 
all things to work out extremely well for her good. We commit this Bible study to you. We commit this time. We lean and trust in you, Lord. We're just turning and looking to you, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, guide us in the way that we are to go. Thank you, Almighty God. In Jesus' name do we pray. You are our Father. You are our family. You are our friend. We love you. And we know that you love us. In Jesus' name, by the power and authority of his name, and as his representative on this earth, we pray. Amen. All right. Amen, people. All right. Once again, thank you for joining the Bible study. You guys have a wonderful weekend. And hope everything goes wonderfully for you in every way. In the name Thank of Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good night. Right. You, you guys have a good night. Take care. Good night.